if I can convene us. All right, well, um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to those in person and online. I'm Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of School of Public Health here at Boston University. And on behalf of the school, welcome to today's event. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the last, actually, of this, uh, of this uh, calendar year of uh, the fora that we host throughout the year. Um, at these events, we always welcome speakers who help us better understand the social, economic, and environmental conditions that shape health. Uh, we have, in the past year, been doing these events with uh, co-hosts, and I would like to formally thank the Boston University College on, of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, Sargent College for co-hosting this, and the Dean Chris Moore, who's here with us today. Thank you. You know, broadly speaking, I, in, uh, in public health, we often get into the trap of, um, of complaining about health, and, uh, and I, I feel like sometimes it's important to remind us that uh, our health is actually better than any time in our history. But at the same time, while we say that, while we say it accurately, that our health is better than it's ever been, not everyone has enjoyed an equal share of this progress. We have enormous health gaps, and a lot of those health gaps are between different groups. And uh, as I've written in a lot of my writing, the core aim of public health is not just to make our collective health better, but also to narrow health gaps and make sure we have equitable distribution of health. And we've had several speakers who have explored these health gaps. And today's speaker is one of the pioneers in exploring these health gaps, particularly in the context of the Asian American community, focusing on the challenge of diabetes. It was my great pleasure to introduce Happy Araneta. Happy is a professor of epidemiology in the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health at the University of California, San Diego. She serves on the National Institutes of Health Advisory Council for the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and she's recently moved from that to being on the NIH Council of Councils. She is the co-principal investigator of the Diabetes Prevention Program Outcome Study at UCSD and PI of the UCSD Filipino Health Study and co-investigator of the Rancho Bernardo Study, where she directs health disparity research in a whole group of uh, people. In 2014, she received the American Diabetes Association's Vivian Fonseca Award for her research on diabetes in Asians and Pacific Islanders. In, in 2015, she received the ADA's uh, 2015 Best of Care recognition for authoring one of the most noteworthy articles in diabetes care. She was also the inaugural endowed lecturer for the Lawrence and Evelyn Wing Family Lectureship on Diabetes at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center here at Harvard Medical School. Her research has been featured um, prominently nationally and globally. She has made press appearances in all sorts of places and uh, in really in, in a who's who of media. Um, on a personal note, I've had the privilege of um, knowing Happy over many years because of our shared interests in health gaps and health disparities, and I have um, learned enormously from her. So I'm really looking forward to her comments. Happy. Thank you, Dean Galea, and thank you to all of you for this warm welcome to Boston, even though I, I was hoping for snow, being from San Diego. Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat in my language. So at NIMHD, we operate on this framework on, um, to understand health disparities, which includes several levels of influence from the individual community to societal level, and it's that framework with which I'd like to present today's data. Asians have recently outnumbered Hispanics as the largest and fastest growing group of new immigrants. This has been the trend for the last eight years. And so currently, Asians comprise 6% of the population, half that of African Americans, but are projected to be equivalent to the size of African Americans at 14% by 2065, and are projected to comprise the largest immigrant populations by 2065. In California, we're already recognizing these demographic shifts, where Asians and Pacific Islanders comprise 15% of the population, more than twice that of the African American population. But how often do you come across articles in medical journals about health disparities in Asian Americans. There are approximately 21 million Asian Americans. The largest groups are Chinese, who have been here for five or six generations, Filipinos, Asian Indians, Japanese, Koreans, and Vietnamese, numbering at more than one million. And then recent immigrants include people from Nepal um, and Myanmar. Where do we live? We live on the West Coast. There are among the 21 million Asian Americans, one third live in California. And there's also a sizable group in New York City, as well as Boston, a large Hmong population in St. Paul, 
and uh, Vietnamese populations in Texas. So this model minority is a myth. Um, however, even as far back as 1987, when this Time Magazine cover appeared, about the Asian American whiz kids followed by the tiger moms and the Asian advantage in this New York Times article, um, and the recent movie, Crazy Rich Asians, has obscured the disparities, social and economic disparities, as well as health disparities that occur in Asian American populations. The generalization that they're well-educated, they're affluent, they have access to care, and therefore must not have health disparities. I, I happened to watch Crazy Rich Asians on the flight here yesterday. <laughs> and I think the, um, so there are disparities even within that movie where you have the brown Asians serving as the domestic workers. But in the Asian American professor, the economics professor from New York City, I don't know if she knew that among Asian, that Asian Americans have the highest poverty rates in New York City. This allowed me an opportunity to look at census data in Boston. And next to Hispanics, one out of three Asians in Boston live at the poverty level. So very similar to poverty rates in Hispanics for the last four years. You'll see the completion, college completion on the x-axis and income on the y-axis. Asian Indians have the highest household income. Why is that? Your cell phones need to work. So Asian migration in the United States have increased by 50% just in the last 10 years alone. Large of, um, and a large number of them are working in Silicon Valley. There's a, my brother works for Google, my nephew works for Apple. There is a shortage of not just electrical engineers at a PhD level, but a shortage of telephony engineers, so they recruit heavily from India. And so half of the H-1B visas that are allocated to people with special skills actually go to Chinese and um, Indian migrants. Next to Indians, Filipinos who have been here even before uh, the 13 colonies were established, migrated to California and Louisiana when those parts of the country still belonged to Spain. So Filipinos have um, higher household incomes. And you'll see that the green line there represents a proportion of Americans with a college degree at 30%. And Asians collectively have about a 51% college completion rate. But you see the um, rates of college completion among Cambodians, Laotians, Hmong, and Vietnamese are lower than that of the US average. And they've been here since 1975, so over 43 years. So why are there these educational disparities? A lot of it, again, has to do with when they arrive. So 60% of Asian Americans are immigrants. That means 40% have, are descendants of migrants who came as early as 150 years ago. If you look at the bottom, though, where the H-1B visas are uh, given to people with specific skill sets. They're primarily from China and India, whereas you have people who fled the Vietnam War, um, left, left the killing fields in Cambodia, in Laos as early as 40 years ago. So that in understanding health disparities, it becomes important to understand the context in which people migrated in the first place. If you consider those without a high school diploma, Hmong, Cambodian, Laotian, and Vietnamese populations, again, these are people who have been here for 40 years, you see that over half of the Hmong, Cambodian, and Laotian populations have not completed high school. And this includes people who are ages 25 and older, which exceeds the US average and the collective Asian American average. English proficiency is an important determinant of, uh, in, in so far as accessing healthcare and in terms of understanding health literacy. If you look at English proficiency, it's pretty high among Filipinos and Indians. Why? The Philippines was a US colony since 1898. The mode of education is still in English. And that's true in India also. So 
in understanding health disparities, it also it's, it's important to consider the colonial relationships between the immigrants and the countries to which they've migrated to. But you'll notice that English proficiency is pretty low for the non-US or non-UK colonized populations um, and the non-Japanese who have been here for about four or five generations. What does that mean when you're trying to implement interventions if half of the population don't understand what you're talking about? The um, NIH supports the study of Latinos which includes 16,000 Latinos in four cities. And aside from English, they have one language, and that's Spanish. There's no Asian American cohort, and even if there were, how many language, languages would you have to consider? I was born in the Philippines. I only speak two of the 87 languages in our 7,000 island uh, country. So I, again, was very interested in local data. And I understand that next to Long Beach, California, Lowell, Massachusetts has the second largest Cambodian population in the United States. If you look at Chinese and Vietnamese in Boston and Cambodians in Lowell, you'll notice the majority are, are foreign born. But look at the rates of low English proficiency. Half to almost 3 fourths have low English proficiency and over one-third have not completed high school. These are adults over the age of 25. And you'll look at the college graduation rates and the disparities there where um, almost half of the Chinese have completed college, but only 11% of Cambodians have college degrees um, and 16% among Vietnamese. And poverty rates, interestingly, for Chinese Americans, with high college attainment is at 32%. So I wanted to show this 30 second video about the Cambodians in Long Beach. Asian, what pops into your head? They think we all supposed to be like doctors. Or yeah, they think we're like, rich families. Yeah, we don't, not these Asians. While Asian Americans are the best educated ethnic group in the US, Cambodian American students graduate high school at a shockingly low rate. I don't like studying, I hate doing homework. It's just like attending class. It's difficult for me. How many Fs did Shamika have? <laughs> More than anyone should have. Many Cambodian families in the US are still reeling from the trauma of the killing fields they fled in the 1970s. We have come to this country fractured. Our families physically have been fractured. And at the same time, you have to navigate school, your social life. We are struggling, our community is struggling. If you don't pass, there's no graduation at the end of this rainbow. Behind every number, there's a story. America by the Numbers with Maria Hinojosa. So the, full, the full document can be accessed online, and what's mentioned in the full document is that post-traumatic stress disorder is so common in Cambodian, Lao, and Hmong populations, especially with the genocide that happened with the Pol Pot regime. A lot of the intellectuals who were killed and those who were, remained, who survived, were parents who did not have access to an education, so they, couldn't, they can't guide their kids towards applying to college here in the United States. But also the rates of uh, PTSD among older Cambodian adults exceeds that of US military veterans. What's also um, hypothesized but not been studied extensively is what are the effects of intergenerational PTSD and depression? If you're a child who was raised by parents who are grieving the loss of family, um, of family relatives from that war. Okay, so these are, so I'm going to transition. I'm going to talk about um, a few health outcomes with an emphasis on diabetes. There's been a lot of interest in uh, suicide attempts um, and suicide ideation among Asians and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. And these rates per 100,000 show that they're slightly elevated among Asians and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations. And I just summarized this slide from the American Psychological Association. I have absolutely no training in mental health, but felt uh, 
it was you know, part of my responsibility to communicate this information in the hopes that those of you who have such expertise would consider working with these communities. Suicide was the eighth leading cause of death for Asian Americans, but number 11 among um, all racial groups combined. US-born Asian American women had a higher lifetime rate of suicidal ideation compared to the general populations, and Asian American college students were more likely than white American students to have had suicidal thoughts. And among all women who, um, who conducted, who completed suicide, not just a, an attempt or ideation, women between the ages of 65 to 84 years of age in that age category, Asian American older women had the highest suicide rate. So cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death among Americans. Among Asian Americans, it's cancer. And I, I'm going to walk you through these uh, slides shortly, but just wanted to show the differences in the distribution and the types of cancers. So you see lung cancer in blue is quite similar among non-Hispanic white males here, and it's similarly um, high among Chinese and Filipino men. The differences appear when we start looking at stomach cancer, which is highest among Korean populations and Japanese, as well as liver cancer. So chronic hepatitis B um, virus infection, and it's endemic in certain uh, countries in Asia with limited uh, hep B vaccine availability is a known risk factor for liver disease, for liver cancer. And there's been um, attempts to increase awareness about hep B vaccination in the Asian Pacific Islander community. A very effective um, intervention program was started in San Francisco and in the Vietnamese American community through a telenovela. So I think it's useful to become um, creative in trying to communicate messages effectively and broadly. These are liver cancer mortality data where the rates among non-Hispanic whites appear in red, and you'll see that liver cancer for all Asian subgroups exceed that of non-Hispanic whites and are highest among Vietnamese, Americans, and Koreans. The good news is that these rates are declining with more awareness about vaccination. So you see those trends among both uh, men and women. Stomach cancer, everybody, at least in California, are so into their probiotics and uh, fermented foods. But I guess certain fermented foods or in certain quantities can be harmful. And that's hypothesized to contribute to the elevated prevalence of stomach cancer in Koreans as well as in Japanese. So these rates exceed that of all the Asian subgroups and exceeds that of non-Hispanic whites. The good news, again, is that it's on a downward trend. Where are we seeing increasing trends? There's an increasing trend, um, well, first in pancreatic cancer for both men and women. And the reason for this is uh, higher rates of diabetes. Um, but you'll see that even historically, rates of pancreatic cancer have been higher among Japanese American women compared to whites and other Asian subgroups. But you're seeing an increase among Chinese and as well as among Vietnamese women and an increase in pancreatic cancer temporally among Koreans. Colorectal cancer mortality is um, also increasing somewhat among Vietnamese uh, men and women. Some of this has to do with um, just differences and disparities in access to and completion of colorectal cancer screening. And so with regards to breast and prostate cancer, mortality have been highest among Filipina women for breast cancer as well as prostate cancer. Why is this? So Filipinos have the second highest incomes. A lot of the Filipinos came here as nurses. As a US colony, our medical education followed that of the United States. They have access to care. They have high health literacy. Um, screening rates are poor for Filipinas, um, despite high income, high knowledge, and being, in, being health professionals. 
the primary complaint is the pain when it comes to, to mammograms. So there are different um, uh, perceptions about the, the or different um, practices when it comes to screening and I guess different levels in tolerance of pain. This slide was produced by the International Diabetes Federation and which emphasized that uh, the burden of diabetes is in Asia and the Pacific Islands. Shortly after this, they announced that India and China are currently the diabetes capitals of the world. So these are absolute numbers, but when you talk about prevalence, the prevalence of diabetes, type 2 diabetes in China, is similar to that of Mexico. When we started to look at type 2 diabetes, and the reason was I was I'm a, trained as a perinatal epidemiologist. I was attending a birth defects conference. And at that time, our department chair, Dr. Elizabeth Barrett Connor, um, didn't know my ethnicity. And she just came up to me and she said, we noticed that at the Veterans Administration Hospital, the majority of the patients in the dialysis units are thin Filipino men. They have access to care, they're in the Navy. They have to exercise, the Navy requires it. They have to maintain reasonable um, weight uh, because that's, that's also required. Were they just not screened or were they, di were they just diagnosed late um, until they started manifesting kidney dysfunction? When we looked at the literature, the earliest study we could find was a study that was conducted almost 60 years ago. This was before the obesity epidemic among 38,000 uh, people in Hawaii. So just by, by context, who were these people when um, the U.S. annexed the United States in 1896, a lot of the Native Hawaiians refused to work for the president of the Hawaiian Republic, who was Dole, of the Dole Plantation. So um, the Native Hawaiians refused to work in the plantations, and so they recruited agricultural workers from Asia who were used to um, the, the hot weather in Hawaii. So these were... A lot of them were agricultural workers. They were thin, physically active, but look at diabetes prevalence where it was only 7% among whites, twice that among Chinese, and three times that among Filipinos, Koreans, and Japanese. And then um, uh, 48 per thousand among Native Hawaiians. So this was the earliest uh, publication that we could find 40 years later, the North Kohala study in the Big Island of Hawaii sampled, they did door-to-door -door sampling. It was a population-based study. And if you look at the body mass index, you'll notice that it was about 25 for whites, Filipinos, uh, Japanese, and other mixed Asians, and 31 kilograms per meter squared among Native Hawaiians. So you would expect the Native Hawaiians to have the highest diabetes prevalence. But instead, you see that the patterns are similar to what was published 60 years ago. So 4.4% among whites, and then 19 to 21% among Filipinos, Japanese, other mixed um, Asians, and 19% and among Native Hawaiians. Oh, this was supposed to be a pop quiz, where you're asked to name the, th so, uh, I don't know if you have Kaiser Hospitals here. It's a large uh, health maintenance organization. Uh, you can access Kaiser through your work so that anyone at my university, whether they're professors or custodians, um, can, can select Kaiser as their healthcare provider. And they looked at their medical records, of two million members, and, um, and so they published this paper and identified the ethnic groups with the highest diabetes prevalence. So you, it's too late for the pop quiz. I think I already showed the slide. But it shocked the medical community that the top three groups included Pacific Islanders. We have a sizable Native Hawaiian and Samoan population. Number two were Filipinos. Number three were South Asians, higher than the prevalence of groups that are perceived to be at highest risk for type 2 diabetes. And if you look at Southeast Asians, which includes Cambodians, Thai, um, you'll see that Southeast Asians, Japanese, Vietnamese, Korean, Chinese, 
members of Kaiser, their relative risk was 50%, showed a 50% higher risk compared to whites. So this shocked the medical community because there are all these thin Asians. Why do they have type 2 diabetes? And I wanted to emphasize the importance of disaggregating Asian American subgroups. If you report diabetes incidence for all Asians, it looks lower than African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans, which is what's happened in the medical literature. Oh, those Asians, they have lower prevalence. It's only when you disaggregate that you appreciate the, the disparities where uh, incidence is significantly higher among Pacific Islanders, Filipinos, and South Asians. This orange line represents a BMI of 30, and you'll notice for all of the Asian subgroups, they all fall below that obesity cut point, whether they have incident diabetes, newly diagnosed, or they're or they don't or non-diabetic. Shortly after this publication, N. Haynes published this paper that showed that even when you collectively report type 2 diabetes among Asians, it's very similar to non-Hispanic blacks and to all Hispanics. And what's notable is if you look at the green lines, that shows the prevalence of undiagnosed diabetes. So in the United States, according to N. Haynes data, 51%, half of Asian Americans with diabetes, aren't aware they have diabetes. So they have the highest prevalence of undiagnosed diabetes. So we were approached by the American Diabetes Association to um, redefine the cut points for BMI screening among Asian Americans. And we um, includes Will Shu of the Jocelyn Diabetes Center at Harvard, Alka Kanea at University of California in San Francisco, Jane Chang from the American Diabetes Association, and Will Fujimoto from the University of Washington in Seattle. So there is no national study like the study of Latinos. There is no national Asian American cohort. Instead, we relied on four cohort studies where they diagnosed type 2 diabetes through the gold standard, through an oral glucose tolerance test. And that includes the Masala study, mediators of atherosclerosis among South Asians living in America, which is the most clever acronym of any uh, study. Um, the North Kohala study in the Big Island and the Seattle Japanese Diabetes Community Study, which has followed three generations of uh, Japanese Americans and our cohort in San Diego. And so what we found was that if you, the recommendations in 2015 was to screen people over the age of 45 with a BMI of 25 kilograms per meter squared. If that were the practice still, you would miss one out of three Asian Americans with a BMI lower than 25. That includes this woman who was newly diagnosed, five foot four and 93 pounds. So we're pleased that the guidelines have been changed. We don't know how effectively they're being implemented. When I asked our medical students if they've heard about the new screening guidelines in their endocrinology classes, most have said no. So we started the screening, uh, the Screen at 23 campaign. Massachusetts is the third state following Hawaii and California to pass this resolution. We anticipate that over 300,000 Asian Americans could be identified um, if you screen them at a BMI of 23. But another consideration, um, I don't know if there are clinicians in the room but the gold standard of a two-hour oral glucose tolerance test is considered inconvenient, both to the patient and to the provider. And the, preval the combined prevalence was 18.4%. But typically, when you're um, evaluated, they'll administer the um, A1C test. You don't need to fast. But using that criteria, the prevalence is only 9%, so you're only identify identifying half of Asian Americans with diabetes. Previously, a fasting glucose test would be administered, and so the prevalence is just 5%. But this two-hour glucose tolerance test identified the most Asians. So 
if screening is limited to the current practice of just an A1C test or a, flat or a fasting glucose, almost half of Asian Americans with diabetes might remain undiagnosed. So it speaks about the differences in the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes, um, especially among non-obese Asians. And this trend has also been observed among older Caucasians in our Rancho Bernardo study. So the question is, how can we identify these people with what's called isolated post-challenge hyperglycemia without the inconvenience of a two-hour test? What other metrics um, or algorithms could be created? So again, just to show if you use an A1C test, the group that's mostly affected are the Japanese. It looks like prevalence is only 4%. But when you compare that, when you do a, a two-hour oral glucose tolerance test, it triples. So two-thirds of Japanese Americans would not be diagnosed if screening was just limited to an A1C test. So what about prevention? The Diabetes Prevention Program has been very successful in demonstrating that if you randomize people to a lifestyle intervention, the the uh, reduction in progressing from prediabetes to diabetes reduces by 58%. However, metformin works just as well. And so if you're, if you're obese, metformin reduces your risk by 53%. However, if you're a thinner person, metformin is pretty useless in delaying the progression from type from prediabetes to type 2 diabetes. So that this speaks to the need to look at other interventions, lifestyle as well as pharmaceutical interventions, to reduce the risk among thinner populations. The DPP studies in India and China also showed similar results where metformin was not effective in the delaying the progression of prediabetes to diabetes. So again, why study Filipinos? Because the majority of dialysis patients were thin Filipino men. And we were interested, we, um, it was a volunteer sample, 453 women, 109 men. We were interested in understanding why. Why do thin Asians have high diabetes prevalence? You look at, this, this is our healthiest cohort. These are people without cardiovascular disease. Filipinas, um, half of them had college degrees, didn't smoke, uh, didn't drink, exercise frequently. When we were looking at different measures of adiposity, African Americans had the highest values using all these criteria. However, when we did CT scans to look at visceral adipose tissue, this is a six millimeter slice between the L4 and L5 vertebrae. You see that this harmful intra-abdominal fat, this visceral adipose tissue, is 25 cubic centimeters in this overweight African American, but it's three times that in this thin Filipina with a BMI of 20, five foot four, 115 pounds. So excess visceral fat accumulation has been shown not just in Filipinos, but in Asian Indians, Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans. And the big question is why? What, what advantage, what evolutionary advantage um, leads to the accumulation of excess visceral fat. And on the other hand, does an African-American woman who is considered overweight, should she be considered unhealthy if her fat accumulation is in subcutaneous fat in the thighs and um, subcutaneous areas? So an important question is, how can you diagnose excess visceral adipose tissue without doing CT scans in everyone? And then the more important and practical question is how do you get rid of it? How do you convince a woman who's five foot four and 115 pounds that she's at risk for diabetes and has a lot of excess visceral fat within her 26 inch waistline and that she's at risk? So um, what we found was even if you use the, the cut point of a BMI of 23 and a BMI of, of among Filipinos and a BMI of 25 in African Americans and Caucasians. You see that African Americans have the least visceral fat, and this has been replicated among people of African descent in England and in South America. And you see that Filipinas have the most visceral fat. <clears throat> 
in the yellow line. So what we saw was this excess visceral fat among Filipinas. Diabetes prevalence was 6% among Caucasians, twice that among African Americans, and 32% among Filipinas. The Centers for Disease Control estimates that in the year 2050, one out of three Americans will have type 2 diabetes. Among women, Filipina women in San Diego were already there. So these um, fat distribution patterns are seen among South Asians and Chinese Americans who have excess visceral fat compared to African Americans. And you see more um, pericardial fat in Chinese Americans. And we also saw that excess pericardial fat among Filipinas. So the assumption that those Asians have healthy diets um, and they're thin, they eat lots of vegetables, um, how, does, how does that contribute to visceral fat and pericardial fat accumulation? The second biological factor we were interested in were inflammatory markers and specifically cytokines. When you have a lot of visceral fat, adiponectin is a cytokine that regulates glucose homeostasis. You want to have high levels of adiponectin. And the question we asked is, among people with normal glucose levels, are there ethnic differences in adiponectin levels? And we found that African Americans in yellow and Filipinas in orange had half the adiponectin levels of whites. There was a study in the Philippines that showed that there are polymorphisms, mutations in the adiponectin gene. So what does this mean? Could adiponectin be a useful screening tool for Asian Americans instead of the glucose, uh, the oral glucose tolerance test? And, and could synthetic adiponectin become a new insulin as a form of a treatment or management? Um, there have been some discussions that a high fiber diet will increase adiponectin, and then recent publications that it's coffee that raises your adiponectin levels, but Asians drink tea. So the, more ad the lower your adiponectin levels, the higher the diabetes prevalence. So interventions are, are needed. Why should we be concerned about this? Does this just apply to Asians, this phenotype of thin on the outside but metabolically obese on the inside? It actually affects one-third of all Americans. I think the attention to Asians led to this discovery where 21% of whites have this type of phenotype and about 31% of blacks also have this normal weight but metabolically abnormal phenotype. Some of the social, cultural, and behavioral risk factors include, like all other groups, lower education, low English proficiency, low adult interaction with mainstream society, having lots of children, sustained childhood and adulthood social disadvantage, insufficient sleep, low muscle to total abdominal ratio, and sitting too much. And so this was work by one of my former medical students that showed even if you adjust for family history and adiponectin, um, having, not having a college education is still a risk factor. These are some of the um, social risk factors. Having lots of children, so what are the, gives you more visceral fat and um, exacerbates your risk for diabetes? What does this mean for populations that don't have access to contraception or belong to cultures where large families are valued? And what about sleep? So I mentioned about a third of our participants were nurses, and many of them work the night shift, and that becomes a cultural choice to keep a cohesive family structure where you work at night um, so that you're available in the daytime to uh, take your kids to school and maintain the households. And you'll see that Filipinas, um, about a f more than a fourth slept less than six hours. And so this translated into a higher risk for diabetes after adjusting for um, visceral fat as well as adiponectin and other known risk factors. <clears throat> 
the, uh, the question was asked uh, earlier during one of my meetings as well, is diabetes risk higher in the Philippines? And is it the, the Western culture? I mean, studies have shown that rates of diabetes are lower in Japan, but they increase once they migrate here. And what we found was uh, we looked at data from immigrants in San Diego, second and third generation Filipinos in Hawaii, and people in the Philippines from a population-based study. We found the Filipinos in Hawaii had higher prevalence of obesity, but there was no difference in diabetes prevalence. Why is that? You only see this in, so far, Filipino and Puerto Rican populations because we were U.S. colonies. And as such, acculturation to an American lifestyle didn't require flying to the U.S. Our acculturation to a Western lifestyle occurred back home. And so it's important to also consider these colonial relationships when you're doing um, studies of immigrant populations. Similarly, it didn't matter whether they were recent immigrants or long-term immigrants, fat distribution and diabetes prevalence was the same among our long-term and recent immigrants. But what we found was that, and as you see with other populations, those with low English proficiency in yellow and those who um, had low pattern of English use, they had a higher risk for type 2 diabetes after adjusting for all other known risk factors in our Filipino cohort. And assimilation, especially as adults, was also associated with a higher risk for diabetes. This is work by one of my medical students, Naima Munir, who was um, comparing social connectedness. And that was defined as the number of friends that you have, as well as the number of groups that you participate in. And um, African Americans were uh, more involved in, in social networks. But what she found was that being socially connected was independently associated with a lower risk of diabetes, especially among Filipinas. So does social isolation, especially in immigrant population, does that play a role in, um, in your risk for diabetes, whether it has to do with, with access or depression and the different um, metabolic pathways that are associated with that? Next, I'm going to talk about uh, growth and life course. And the fetal origins of disease postulate that prenatal malnutrition increases your risk of diabetes and cardiovascular uh, disease as adults. And the Dutch winter um, hunger winter family studies where the roads were blocked uh, during World War II, and so people in the Netherlands had limited access to food during the winter. What they found is that those babies who were gestating then and are now in their 70s have a higher risk for diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And so we wanted to look at that in our cohort because my grandfather used to say weeks, a few weeks before Pearl Harbor was bombed as a U.S. colony, the Japanese ships already surrounded the Philippines. And so my grandmother used to mention that she would carry bags of Japanese yen, but there was no food to be purchased in Manila. So we were interested in looking at something similar to the Dutch Hunger Winter Family Study. And what we found was that Filipinas who were, um, sh who were born before the war were significantly taller than those who were born after the war. There's also um, some uh, studies that have shown that it's not just malnutrition, but not getting enough protein. Um, during fetal development that influences insulin secretion. And so we looked, so Claudia Langenberg looked at the role of growth and life course. And we didn't have um, information about their birth weight since they were, many of them were born during the war, but we looked at their leg length as an estimate of childhood nutrition. And what she found was that shorter leg length was associated with a higher risk of coronary heart disease, and that sustained low, and low childhood and adult socioeconomic status were associated with a higher risk of diabetes. So perhaps the 
um, important consideration for lower income populations, whether they're in India, the diabetes capital of the world, or whether they're in New York or in Boston, is that the opportunity to disrupt diabetes prevention is, occurs during pregnancy. Gestational diabetes is highest among Asian Indians, Filipinos, Southeast Asians, Chinese, and Pacific Islanders. So is that where the injury occurs, the injury to, the pancre to pancreatic development? And these are, um, so this also shows that gestational diabetes is higher among immigrant populations in San Diego and highest among foreign-born Filipinas, Pacific Islanders, and foreign-born Asians. And the risk factor for gestational diabetes is usually preconceptional obesity, but uh, these women were not obese. And you'll see that preterm birth is also higher among US-born Filipinas and Asians. The beautiful finding here is that when we look at um, disparities among immigrant populations, it's also an opportunity to look at what are some of the advantages. And we were surprised to find that Somali refugees had the lowest rate of preterm birth. And this has been shown in Scandinavian countries and in Australia. So what is it about Somali women that allows them to have term pregnancies? Is it um, the social structure of the way they care for their pregnant women? Are there differences in the vaginal microbiome, for example? But what are the protective effects that would benefit all Americans? So I wanted to um, mention some of the cultural factors that I've mentioned before. Low English proficiency, which are barriers, the ethnicity of the healthcare provider, the belief in a spiritual ideology of disease. There was a paper um, among a uh, Hmong group that, were, that uh, articulated their concerns about joining studies because it might disrupt the process of reincarnation. And so the reluctance to join studies, um, having the conflict between traditional and Western beliefs in Filipino cultures, the fatalism that if it's God's will for you to have this illness, it'll be God's will to also cure you of that illness. Modesty, burden to family members and taking you to clinic appointments, and as mentioned before, intergenerational post-traumatic stress disorder. And could the interventions be among thin Asians? Could they increase muscle mass rather than lose weight? Might that be an effective intervention? Could um, this fascinating paper showed that among um, recent migrants from Laos and Myanmar and Thailand, their gut microbiome changes immediately once they come to the US, even though they're eating um, traditional foods, so that, and then they start losing the enzymes to break down uh, tamarind and coconut and palm. So this becomes an exciting new opportunity to look at other mechanisms that seem to explain the high risk among non-obese Asians. Um, so, so what can you do for, for those who are students here? I think the opportunity starts in looking at your own communities. Dr. Tu Kwok, who um, was, uh, uh, got her doctorate in environmental epidemiology at Berkeley, noticed that the women in her family had respiratory disorders, neck pain, some breast cancers, and they were all nail salon workers. And so she was very effective in um, publishing some data that showed a marginal risk for repro adverse reproductive health outcomes. And this was inspired by her mom and her aunt's diagnosis. And she started, was able to translate some of her epidemiologic findings into health policy interventions and started the California Nail Salon Collaborative so that um, the products are less hazardous, there's a decent living wage that's included, and that's could, um, so that's, I, I shared this slide as a source of um, inspiration for some of you who might want to work with your communities, even though it's, um, it's a small community. And lastly, this is a community intervention. Strive, we work with 15 uh, Asian American restaurants. And what was most successful was Halt the Soy Sauce campaign. We just asked the um, 
gross, the restaurant owners to not include those condiments and salt and soy sauce and fish sauce consumption went down significantly. The owners were very happy. So that's just a way to, um, and we were able to enhance nutritional literacy in those communities, people who had never looked at a nutritional label. So I'm excited also to uh, share that there are several um, NIH-funded studies to look at these and other mechanisms to explain these disparities. We're most excited to look at Taxi Step, which looks at um, interventions among ta Bangladeshi, Indian, and Pakistani taxi drivers in New York City. Other opportunities to look at different mechanisms and maraming salamat for your attention today, and especially to our, our team in San Diego and mostly to the study participants who um, braved our needles and our pokes and came back to clinic at baseline five years later and 10 years later. Thank you. So I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. It was lovely. Um, so I wonder about, uh, we talked about the aggregation of Asians and then when we disaggregate we find differential findings and we seem to be doing that as well with um, Latinos and then we have like non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic Asian. So what about, do we ever address those Hispanic black, Hispanic Asian, Hispanic like all those other combinations, and do we find disparities there as well? I don't know. I think the study of Latinos allows that opportunity to um, distinguish uh, dis Dominicans, for example, from Puerto Ricans, but this is, this is based on self-report. Now that we have tools to identify your genetic admixture, how would that conflict with your biological um, assessment of your race ethnicity versus your identification. I thought I was 100% Filipino. Ancestry.com says I'm 32% Samoan or Tongan. I'm also part Uzbek. That's how Islam went to the Philippines. I'm Asian Indian also, Spanish, Native American because the Spanish brought um, 70,000 uh, Aztec and Guerrero Indians during the Acapulco Manila galleon trade. So my self-identification is Filipino, but my risk factors might differ because my genetic information classifies my um, admixture differently. the uh, quotation in Skinny um, with the study of, um, of, uh, of the folks that are coming being westernized and being maybe one of the um, results maybe could be an incentive to fatten them up in quotes like you are in, 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 your in this um, presentation by mm -hmm. giving them an incentive. A fat means like westernized, they, they see the behavior, well, they see something when they come here, but their behavior is different. So maybe the fact could be that they see that a lot of people here, Westernized, have a lot of money in their pocket. So maybe that behavior is the fact that they need to maybe change their behavior. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you understand what I mean? Um, um, well, to respond to the, the first yeah. part, the skinny was just the colloquial term for the the, the details, the truth. Um, but but I think I'm I'm following, following your my, interest in that. My sister's a clinician, for example, and she talked. I'm not a clinician, uh, but she way. was talking to her patients about the benefits of red rice, and um, and so this recent immigrant patient said, red rice is what we serve to our pigs. I want the fancy, polished, scented jasmine rice. And so there's this sense of prosperity when you migrate here, and you don't want the fish that you caught yourself in, in your island, you want 
the, the stake and every everything else that comes along with it because it reinforces your sense of prosperity. You want something that you didn't have access to before, but it also um, suggests you know, inclusion if you're eating what other Americans are eating. Does that respond yeah. to your inquiry? Well, sort of, or even give them a monetary incentive. Um, maybe that'll be their fat. Maybe uh -huh. that's the fat they're, they're yeah. I, I'm not sure what it is, but maybe giving them an incentive. You come in for your screening, um, we'll give you a $25 gift card yeah. to uh, a grocery store so you could buy some fruits and vegetables right. or something like that. And, and so there are different, in, in our cohort, we didn't have um, a fiscal incentive. What we offered was a round trip ticket um, in any of the 48 states at the end of data completion. So we, we had a forum, we presented the results. Um, I think the bias is that in our cohort, many were nurses, and so they understood the value of um, clinical studies. I think it made a tremendous difference that the PI looked like them, and many of them had said that, you know, Dr. Araneta would never do a Tuskegee on us. And that was said several times. Um, and so I think there has to be that element of trust with, with the team. And, um, but so incentives, uh, the incentive was the possibility of winning this raffle, but that, that didn't seem to be a, a sufficient motivator for our, the STRIVE study. We had, um, we also had raffles so that if they completed the questionnaire, they would be eligible for a raffle for a $25 um, coupon at that restaurant. But I think money motivates people um, uh, in, different, yeah, in different ways. And uh, first of all, that was terrific, thank you. Uh, can you uh, comment a little bit on, from your perspective, what is best practice in terms of categorizing people in studies when, when sort of ethnic group of origin is important? And th this has been something which has haunted me, I feel, throughout my career. I've always been very much annoyed by the sort of Asian label. And you know, hearing a presentation like yours, it, it makes one feel uh, the absurdity of that label. So I'm just curious from your perspective, you know, recognizing the challenges of small sample sizes, et cetera, um, what are best practices for dealing with that issue? I think it depends on the, the population that you have access to. We're able to do that in California because we have one third of all the Asian Americans in a place like Boston, for example, where there's a sizable Chinese, Vietnamese, and um, population, very few Filipinos, fewer Asian Indians, I think the, the decision should be based on the population in the community where you're sampling from. I think we've just now transitioned into removing Pacific Islander from Asian American Pacific Islanders because they unfortunately also are lumped together in this model minority myth and that they have good outcomes when they um, have serious uh, adverse health outcomes that are never addressed because of their small size. So if it were Boston, I would do Chinese, Vietnamese. If you include Lowell, I would uh, include Cambodian. I do want to say thanks, first of all, for coming out here and illuminating Pleasure. what's going on on the other side of the country. Um, doing some of this work in Boston is really interesting. Um, I'm Caribbean with Asian Indian descent. Um, and aside from that, it's like a lot of the things that want to be representing for marginalized communities are still helmed by like white people, right? So the organization that you mentioned um, around nutritional literacy, we have one of those in, in Boston. Um, not gonna name it in case anyone works there, but I mean, it's, it's all white people. There's actually no one in there that can do like the ethnic um, cuisine from their own culture to bring that forward in that lens of health. Now, I work for a health equity research program that actually does have its hands in researchers who are people of color and advocates who are people of color that are trying to involve communities in research. So my question is, what can we learn from that, um, from, from your case studies over on the other side of the country? What data can we pull from that? Or how can we learn from that to develop our own studies or collaborate with folks all across the country that are doing this work? I, I think, first of all, the um, race, ethnicity of the, the researchers, the community, outreach people. Um, I think it's important to have diversity. 
but also it becomes an opportunity to get people of all ethnicities engaged in in the work um, and exposure to the communities that they would not otherwise have access to. Um, as far as the STRIVE uh, study, we, we just have one publication, which is a, a methods paper, and we're about to submit um, the findings from, first of all, our grocery store intervention, which was done in ethnic mom and pop grocery stores. It's a great place to, to do interventions in a small scale, followed by the, the restaurant paper. So we're happy to, to share resources. Was there another part to your question that I didn't? National dem demographic information for. Uh, oh, so I just got this from census.gov. Census.gov, and then, um, so the latest was in 2010, but then they have the American Community Study, which is Fact Finder. And I think if these slides are available, I had the, the URLs at the bottom, and that's how I was able to find um, the, create the tables about. Um, poverty rates and high school completion rates in Boston. Hello, hi, thanks for your talk. Um, so I noticed that the social and cultural factors that you cited were shared by many Asian subpopulations. So I was wondering if you could expand on the unique factors that explain the high prevalence of diabetes um, in Filipinos. And I'm also curious, what is the benefit of lowering uh, soy sauce and fish loss consumption? Um, hypertension. So we, uh, among, so stroke deaths are highest among Asian, Indians, Filipinos, and Vietnamese. And so we were um, following the Halt the Salt campaign in New York and instead tried to make it culturally relevant by just this Halt the Soy Sauce and Fish Sauce campaign. And that seemed to be a very practical, um, easy intervention. You just take them away. And the, the, the owners were the happiest because it reduced their costs. The, the chefs were happy because they felt offended if people seasoned their food before they even tasted it. And, and, after, and, and people didn't, they could have asked for the soy sauce if the customers could have asked for it, but, but they ended up um, not asking for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you.